All right, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, second, that is important, second uh, physical lecture, or well, mixed physical lecture, and I'm still trying to learn how to look in the camera and at you at the same time. So that will go sideways into either, yeah, exactly. I need to work on my uh, mus muscle uh, uh, mot motility, I believe is the term here, uh, to kind of do that. Um, so last session we started live already, and um, there were like three people, now we are, you know, at roughly 10, which is kind of cool. 11, I count you as well. So uh, 11 people, so it is pretty generous, pretty cool. So thanks for showing up. We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, but I think we need to keep this hybrid mode going anyway, in case things go south. And then we um, quickly back into that desktop here. For the online people, um, or oh, if any one of you could please just open the stream as well, mute it, of course, just to see if things go south, because you may be quicker to detect it than me looking at the chat and realizing that it's too late already for like two minutes or something. So if anyone had the capacity on their machines to do that, would be great. Or perhaps yeah, my, uh, just to monitor if things go sideways. My camera, unfortunately, is about to die, it seems. Uh, I love that one because on the one hand, it's a room cam. On the other hand, it has a really good picture. But I think I shouldn't have transported it, uh, you know, at minus whatever, 15 degrees ex for an extended period on a bicycle. So uh, that may have been slightly unwise. So we'll see if that survives it. Um, because otherwise, I don't have a good recording of the room. So this is actually really good room sound. Note, you're likely on sound if you speak up, of course. But usually, I need to repeat the questions. At least last time, we tried it out. And I had to repeat it to make sense of it. Um, so that's part number one. I'm, as you will learn, not big on bureaucratic, as you will have learned already. Um, but there's one thing I just want to remind you of to, um, you know, you're, you're all into mobile activities and mobile devices and apps and so on. There's this nice QR code, right? And if you're like me, every time you see your QR code, you kind of want to figure out what's on it. And if you try it with that one, you actually land at empty new check-in, which you probably heard about. Yes. No, who has heard about it? Just to give me a feel. No. Um, so the, the, the point is, the point of this thing is, it's basically, I look, look at, oh, yeah, you have it here as well, exactly. They use it for uh, Smithervan, right? So we can do tracing in case things go sideways, you know, let's say me or Siamak has it, and then uh, they can quickly get in touch with you and save you, um, and conversely us. So, um, so it's worthwhile to kind of do that. Um, and as far as I read the terms and conditions, if you do cloud, you always want to read the terms and conditions of services you use, by the way. Um, and uh, they say they delete after 14 days and don't keep any information. So it's just for our own benefit. But given that we're actually not too many people, I'm actually quite relieved about the whole situation uh, for now. So, um, yeah, what, what do we do today? Any ideas? No, uh, we need them. So um, who started the assignment already? Anyone? Good. And any roadblocks so far? No. Do you have everything you need to get started? Okay, well, we let you we, we let you run against the brick wall first, and then we go from there, I guess. So, uh, because, you, yeah, I, well, you actually do, but we didn't really talk about all the nitty gritties yet. And of course, I'm not doing uh, that talking about all the nitty gritties. But if you want to even explore services using Go, I mean, I recommend you to um, we can come back to that. Um, Last time I drew this schema here, and it's barely there. So now I tried in red. The stream mentioned that they can't really see it. They probably still can't. Ah, which is not, not a good idea. So we have like, I draw it right nevertheless. Perhaps the ones that were on the stream last time but couldn't see it get a better appreciation, right? So when you do your assignment, you're building your own service, just with it in green, which is that one here, right? And this service feeds off two other services. and produces something to the client, right? So that's the thing you want to be uh, focused on. And I, I would recommend you to start kind of in poking those third party services that you're going to use to get a feel of what the API is like. So if you have, you know, once you feel you want to turn towards the assignment, start with that and see if you hit some more blocks there. But um, towards the end of the session, we'll um, pick up on this. Red is better. Cool. Thanks for the feedback. The camera keeps freezing. That's not good. Um, yeah, I hope, do you guys have, does the camera work? Um, that is my camera, does it work on Zoom? Yeah, Yeah, it's okay, cool. Um, it, it, it actually, you, you may be right, this camera actually has the tendency to freeze, I, uh, you know, now learned. Um, but um, I think this is probably related to uh, bandwidth, not so much the camera. In fact, uh, one aspect we typically encounter in 255 in the past, I'm not sure if it has changed in the past years, that we have bandwidth issues. So if everyone is on Wi-Fi here, uh, then one of us is not, and that's usually me. 
Um, so we need to watch that. But given we have 11 people now here, I think we can manage that quite well. I can barely see red. I can see green. OK, let's, you know, I confuse it even more. I put blue on it as well. How is blue doing? Uh, so main service in the middle, two um, services to depend on on the side client you're producing too. So that's the kind of narrative here or the, the kind of drawing here. And I kind of will use this again to kind of uh, think, um, talk about the service. Perhaps I make a mini drawing and post it somewhere so you get an intuition what I meant um, when, when I talked about this uh, here. So, okay, red is preferable over blue over green. Cool, thanks, that's helpful. So I start with red first, then use blue, or get a new pen first, and then green. Um, cool. And I, I don't want to push it further because I want you guys to come up with this, not me, because else I do your assignment because the design is, a, is as much as the implementation for that. Um, cool. Okay, today. So you learned in the past few weeks about um, Go quite a bit, right? And um, did you try some of the tasks that Marius gave you? Good. Now here comes the spoiler alert, they're not marked, so, uh, but, but you still want to do them because they're good to kind of get you started, right? So to get your hands dirty, learn your environment, know how you do the, that's the details, we usually don't tell you how to do the configuration setup in your IDE, so it actually works. So you basically, you know, have a running uh, main function and kind of start, uh, can start kind of uh, using things. And I'll give you some more resources. Um, um, uh, to kind of, you know, work with this. Uh, I get some comment here, that's great. Um, someone has done two of them and wants to do the last today. That's great. If you do those, you're really well prepared for kind of uh, the, the some of the activities there. So I recommend you to get your hands dirty and try some of them at least. So you have a running environment, get a feeling. We're not using the algorithmic gritty, nitty bitties, uh, nitty gritties, I guess that's the thing, um, uh, uh, that is provided there or demanded there. Um, but the uh, the idea of you know how to write functions, how to write data structures, plot JSON parsing, and so, so on. And yes, there's a comment there that the last one was rather difficult, and that's true. And um, we don't necessarily push it as far in advanced programming. They kind of work more on the theoretical side, right? So we are working more on the applied science side, using the technology for our purposes. So uh, if you're not able to do one of the other assignment, it doesn't really matter as long as you make some progress and get a feel of the language. That's really what I think is important at this stage. Um, deadline is still 21st. I didn't hear any other objections so far. So we're on track two weeks, slightly less than two weeks left, I guess. Uh, should be enough um, time. But what do I want to talk about today? Because you're here for a reason. Um, ah, you see my blue screen, beautiful. And now I expose myself, I'm using Windows for teaching mostly. Not good, fail. Um, but we have, or you have learned about uh, Go quite a bit, but what we haven't talked about yet. I hope that's visible on the stream. Is that visible on the stream? My shared screen? Yeah, yeah I see here, cool, yeah. Um, so <laughs> what we haven't talked about really too much is of course the whole theoretical underpinning of REST, right? So Marge touched on it a bit, right? You need to write some HTTP requests to get some data from a website or web service in our case and kind of do stuff with this eventually, right? So it comes in different forms and fashions. Um, but given this is a you know, cloud course, you also want to kind of get a bit of a theoretical basics that, that underline all the big picture principles for two reasons. So you understand REST and kind of understand how you know, those web services work generically and the features they can provide. Number two, I have some questions to ask you in the exam. So, uh, sorry for that, still university. We have a bit of theory going on here as well. So it's a bit of a uh, conundrum we're facing. So, um, so I want to talk about rest a bit more, but before doing this, who's that? It's the rest guy. No. The rest guy? Yeah. <laughs> that, that is really cool. That's the rest guy. You know, just, you know, remove the names, you know, in the university lecture, the rest guy, the cloud guy, the web guy, and that's the algorithm data structures guy. And there's the web, uh, web design guy as well. Uh, next to the operating system guy, of course. Um, so, so who's that guy? The, 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 he may or may not have a name. I, my claim here is, he does, but is anyone willing to have a gap go at it? You should know that, not so much for me or for the course I want to ask this question, but it's kind of, for, for you, sometimes you also need to know figures in your field that have, have significance. Who's that guy? Ah, we do, thanks. I, I, I need to be more chat, chat a fiend, sorry for that. A bit of a, this hybrid thing is something I still need to learn, so um, bear with me, let's see. Uh, can perhaps use your Mac proxy and kind of uh, call out 
the, 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 tell me when there's something on the chat yeah, so I can respond. W, 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 w guy. The WWW guy, okay. We're getting closer there. That's actually closer than the rest guy, and I uh, get to it. Why? The WWW guy. Okay. Any other take that's slightly more specific? Rest guy, WWW. For the exam, I'll probably go, you, you get away with the WW guy, with the rest guy, not quite. We'll see why. No? This is like the guy that makes Sony as well. What, they make? Films. He makes Sony for the film. Is something? I actually don't know. It may well be because he has shifted perspective quite a bit and went more corporate, uh, but he's also running a uh, research institute at MIT in the meantime. But he has always this private uh, public service kind of mix um, approach. But I, I think we should turn more on what he did in the past. <laughs> so that's a picture from 1991. Perhaps that helps. And you see it, it's a picture from 1991. Why do you see it? It's not so much his uh, haircut, it's more like the desktop next to it, right? So that gives it away, please. Is it Tim Berners-Lee? Yes, okay. There you go, Tim Berners-Lee, right? So we should know that guy because it's really important in our field, especially when you think about cloud and kind of networking, the also activity, the web in a wild sense. He devised the web, right? So, and um, uh, everyone knows the story? Yes, I hope so. No, yes, no, please. He works at, or worked at, Question mark. Or you complete the sentence kind of thing. He worked at. Someone chatted something. I saw a blinky blinky thing going on. No? CERN. Switzerland? Right? So, and it's not computer science at all. It was, uh, you know, CERN, yes, you know, they're doing this uh, hydrogen collider and, you know, all those uh, physical experiments and so on, quite famous for it. In fact, you should consider. Uh, perhaps doing an internship there as well, right? NTNU frequently offers this. We have a quite privileged relationship with them. So you can go there for half a year or, you know, work there as in whatever facility. And they, of course, need a lot of support from a computer science side, right? Big, big data processing, you know, uh, data shifting wire network and so on. But one of the problems there was actually they didn't know about each other, right? They, they are very interdisciplinary. You have uh, physicists there, you have computer scientists there, you have engineers there because you have to build those, you know, hydrogen collider. Guess what? You need civil engineers. So if anyone does civil engineering, it you know that may also be a, a may have been an objective. Um, other forms of analysts uh, and of course operations people that run systems. And so it's kind of a really diverse environment. The problem is they didn't know about each other and their capabilities. It even got harder because they're changing all the time, right? So it's a very dynamic workspace where international researchers come and leave. And uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he was there in a kind of, um, if I could recall correctly, in more like a research programmer or scientific programming uh, facility. So not like one of the, necessarily the, the, the one doing experiments, but rather uh, preparing the analysis. And he uh, devised a system uh, of hyperlinks. What the heck is that? Anyone? What's hyperlink? I know no one used that term anymore that it did in the 90s. Yeah. Sorry? HTML. It's the foundation of HTML, right? So the idea, the principle of linked pages, hyperlinks. That, ooh, fancy. Uh, so the buzzword thing has gone, but now we talk about links. Uh, he devised this basically. And the idea was there that each of them could have their own homepage and actually create their own homepage in a standardized fashion in a um, format that's nowadays called HTTP. That's, yeah, but the other thing. What's, there's the other protocol. Uh, the XML. Mm, that came late, that came later uh, came in 98 but before that but if we still do it in web technology 101 yeah uh, sorry uh, that is the underlying network infrastructure but coming back to the http that's the closest what's http and there's something that sits alongside http i'm slowly getting nervous okay see you your turn no okay html anyone uh, right, it's two things. Chat. Uh, I have thanks, thanks, chat. Um, yeah, just, just let me know. Thank you very much uh, for for the injection. Exactly, right. Those are not the same thing. They are related, but HTTP is the transport protocol. HTML is the representation language, whatever shows up on your screen. But HTTP is used. You're correct to kind of transport. It. But we need to keep those things kind of distinct because we're looking at one more than the other. Here, for example, in the context of cloud, we're more interested in HTTP transport bit. The representation is less problematic because for representation we use no think back one lecture or two lectures Marius. what do we use for uh, um, data representation mostly uh, do we so will web pages no uh, right uh, jason yeah, 
Oh, you said, okay, I didn't hear that. Good. Yeah, so so the uh, point is, you know, HTTP is still the same protocol, but the presentation protocol lying above those, in our case, is more data structure centric, is here, uh, JSON, not HTML, because we don't do uh, web technology, right? We do cloud technology. So we care more about the APIs and so on. So if you're interested in front end, then we back in HTML well. But he kind of devised this, right? And um, like just without going into much deeper into it, he kind of had this links of websites that people could at least see what they do, you know, published information about them, a bit of a bio page. It kind of came up the uh, kind of initial idea of having those, those friends pages where you can, oh, wait, what am I doing here? So um, link up people more systematically, right? So in the central protocol, there you are. Anyway, uh, it's the hypertext uh, trans uh, hypertext transfer protocol, yeah, literally. And hypertext we discussed is basically uh, a set of documents linked to each other, right? So, and the format of that one is fairly uniform. So we have the transfer protocol and then of course the representation and those are captured here. So it's quite straightforward. And in fact, it's quite funny. If, I think most of you will not have seen the entire uh, um, format of a URL before, all the complexity. So it's kind of worthwhile to think about what it actually all embedded and the kind of features it actually had, right? So on the one hand, in the, in the URL, you kind of have the scheme, what protocol is actually uh, um, you know, used to transfer any sort of payload or content, right? It's more like the address line, you think postcard is basically you know, whom it's designed to, and guess what? We send it by mail, mail or email or hang on fax. Uh, if anyone knows that? No, you're one generation later, right? So anyway, but so this would be the protocol by which you send something, yeah? Um, and then you had the idea of, <laughs> that's the best thing, um, uh, username and password combination in the URL. So everyone who does security has remotely <laughs> invested themselves into concerns about security. That's not what we do anymore. But this is actually part of the original spec, right? So you, the idea was basically there, it was a very, very naive and very safe world we had there. We had a few hosts and people could access their resources by just openly providing a username and password. Uh, and then of course the host, that's something we are well acquainted with, right? Domain, and then uh, the host associated with this with potential subdomains and all that kind of thing. Ports, very important. We talk about ports already. Ports? We talked about ports, yeah. yes. We talked, yes, uh, last, uh, on Monday we talked about ports, right? Because of the redirect, that's right. For uh, Heroku, that's quite important. So ports we have as well. And then you have the path, and uh, we kind of talked a bit about the root path, for example, last time when I talked about the assignment briefly, right? So that can be arbitrarily extended. And then there's some uh, parameters that you can append. It's always signaled by the question mark. So, you know, you see it commonly in web pages, uh, especially PHP web pages, quite heavily used, uh, you know, for parameters that are append. And you can do that as well. It's just, you need to interpret whatever you get. But this is basically a full URL, the features you can exploit and use and expect that any browser supports I'm actually not sure about this bit. I would highly recommend not to work with this, but uh, in principle it is. So that's the, uh, the, the, the um, address point mechanism. Then there's HTTP. That's the transport protocol. And the idea is basically, it's quite simple. It's a um, you know, request response protocol. You have this uniform resource locator, or nowadays really uniform resource identifier as well. So it's not only where things lie, but what they are. So you want to have the unique identification for each of us, but we don't care so much anymore on which server it lies. That's kind of secondary now. Um, but um, the protocol on the line is kind of request, request response, right? So in the a get request, the HTTP is actually quite straightforward. Uh, in case anyone on the stream is worth, I'm basically just pointing at the screen here so you would see exactly what I'm uh, talking about right now. That you have a get request where you just indicate, hey, you know, I'm interested to get everything following the following protocol, HTTP 1.1. They used versions as well, wisely so, right? Because things change. And then here's the host. That's the stuff I want, right? That's the content of those. So this is the, the protocol. And then the payload is the document structure. So that's where HTML comes into play. And what's the response? That's the request. Here's the corresponding response. Of course, that's a very simplistic one, primitive one, but you get the gist just to get it across. I just talked about this briefly, I believe. So first of all, you get a response, hey, I'm actually talking HTTP uh, version 1.1. Cool. You have a 200. What does 200 mean? What? Success, right? So I think in turn, they just call it OK. I think this is literally what's written there. Um, so that worked out. So I mean, the host exists, and it serves um, content. Then there's a date. There's content type. We'll get back to this one, content length. Last modify a lot of additional tags, and they can have grown over time. This is an open-ended list of key value pairs. If you think about the header, right? So, um, if if am I just repeating stuff you heard already elsewhere? 
if yes, the answer, that's cool as well. Okay, just want to be safe because you know I'm we're coming from very diverse backgrounds with respect to your study direction. So just want to be safe. So you have headers, and headers are basically just key value pairs. Some of them are always there, generalized date, for example. Some of them are uh, uh, optional. You can also use those, right? So for your own service, if you need metadata somewhere, likely up there. Uh, if you write your own service. But uh, one thing you want to remember is, for example, the content type, because it basically just says what's in the payload. Yeah, it can be just uh, text, HTML. Guess what? That's the case. But it could also be, uh, what is it, um, text XML, I believe, right? So that would mean, oh, in the text down there in a the payload, expect XML format, right? Or it can be, for example, application slash JSON, right? Then it would be JSON format. So this is the predictor, good one actually of what the uh, content is about but when you write your rest service you will see it really depends on you there's no there's no uh, validation going on per se meaning like just because you put content type json the the http stack in the system doesn't check that you actually send json right that's on you as a developer and you'll find especially if you look at the third party service that you use you can request all different forms of content type hey i want this in xml a good luck you're still getting json Right, so because they may not just tear and not interpret what you said, because as part of the request, you can also say, if there's something available, of course, send it via HTTP, but I want it in this format, right? Because the cool thing could be that you could serve something in XML, HTML, the remote makes sense, uh, and JSON, for example, or YAML, or whatever other format you find funny right now. So, um, you know, there's a certain flexibility uh, there. Anyway, server, but in this case, the connection status and then the of course the actual payload right this is standard html you guys i have seen that before right somewhere please yes yeah i i think i'm sitting at 60 percent saying yes okay so we have eight we have brackets right html and then you have header and we have a body and there's some header which appears in the top line right so in your in your website and then some content it's like super primitive here one and with in here's the point we're not doing web tech so don't worry about it you will not see it again i just want to motivate how this thing whole ties together because this describe this is enough kind of cheating here but roughly enough to kind of design the web as it was in 1991 cool then we're done aren't we yeah cool okay lecture done i i love those lectures they're really really straightforward no well kind guess what we're not quite done right so there are certain shortcomings what's the limitation i mean you literally learned every well in a nutshell you saw everything that was relevant at the time with respect to you know, web interaction. We didn't talk about the server side, how it would be implemented, and so on. The client side browser. He, uh, by the way, Tim Berners Lee wrote the first browser. What was the name of the browser? It's kind of good trivia knowledge, actually. Do you want to play a game? But Netscape now. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. But I think Netscape kind of used some of the sources from the original browsers, actually. That was called Mosaic. So he, he called it this thing. But basically, this browser was able to read this HTML and pass it into some sort of aesthetic form. But, you know, aesthetic at that time was really a bit of a stretch. Uh, you know, you guys have all design thinking background and uh, principle background, so you understand that it's probably not longer state of the art. But, you know, there was some visual representation, at least, not just text. Um, cool. Okay, shortcomings. Is that protocol enough nowadays? What's the limitation of such a web protocol? And especially think about the cloud. Anyone in I hope they hear me. So that's a lot of lot of guessing on my side. Security. security, good point. Yeah. So what came for? Uh, that, that's actually absolutely right. Uh, security was a concern. What what did people come up with to deal with this? Okay. Uh, well, there was the uh, kind of idea having. HTTPS. Yes, correct. Right. We had the secure socket layer uh, idea, and the basically what basically the whole interaction. Mm -hmm will basically be underlying some sort of secure connectivity. So you do the same stuff, but before you do that stuff, you have, you have you establish a secure connection right to the other host, as indicated by HTTPS. So the system knew, the browser knew, oh, you need to use this standardized you know, safety protocol, um, um, uh, you know, SSL at that time, TLS nowadays, I guess, to um, um, establish a safe connection first and then send the same stuff over. Right, so okay, so secure socket layer. That's why layering. So it's not built in, it's just layering one layer below for safety. But that's not the whole story. So security is an aspect, absolutely. But what what else do we have? What if you look at the kind of um, what is it made for? It's 
these kind of protocols. Please. Documents. Documents on the one hand, exactly. For whom are documents good? What, what, or who serves? No, who, who benefits most from documents? What kind of user? Researchers. Researchers, of course. But if you think about, like you know, the usual discussion that we have about machines and people and all that stuff, who whom is that format made for? It's for me, people, right? So because there's no enforced structure on this, right? So you, do, you don't know yet. You can actually yet it looks structures. Of course, machines can interpret it, but only for one purpose to present it on a screen, right? But the content in there is inherently unstructured again, right? It's normal flow text that we that we all know. So that's one thing. Cool. So it's kind of people centric. The other thing, what's another problem here? Look at the protocol features. Yeah, you could. You, know, you append the URL. You, you, you get my page. That's, that's okay. It was built in. But there's your on, on, on track there. So there's something else. What, what doesn't it do well? Yeah. That's perfectly right as well, even though it hasn't been terribly, um, you know, even not necessarily been perfectly solved till today, but, but you're absolutely right. It's more like a, you know, uh, ad hoc kind of interaction, right? So concept of session came later, right? Where you actually retain credentials and, you know, user information over a longer period, more interaction. So, uh, but you're also right from a second perspective, like the, the con is certainly very static, right? You receive the same stuff, guess what? There's not much change there. Uh, you know, unlike the interaction that we have nowadays. But what's the other thing? What can't we really do? Well, I mean, what, what does it constantly assume, this protocol? Precisely. <clears throat> You're only caring about client-side representation. You're assuming a stack server um, information, and if some changes happen, well, guess what? Someone needs to modify this HTML file manually on the server, right? Press save, and then next time there's a request, something is updated. But, please. Here, uh, ah, yes, yes, um, sorry, I repeat the question, the question, or no, so the, the response rather, um, and that was that the, um, there's no means of, you know, uh, reflecting changes on the server side, right? it's always client centric, right, you're requesting information, and you're getting information, but you can't really change anything on the server, so it's a very, you know, uh, web 1.0 kind of problem, right, web, you know, 2.0 movement basically in the beginning, or midst of 2000, I guess, you guys need to correct me there, was basically that we actually start changing server-side content, right? That's why all of the different uh, uh, social networking sites became big because we suddenly, as users, can no longer only consume and receive information, but also produce information, which has completely taken over the web. So that was not part of it. And there is a lot of technologies that deal with this, of course, nowadays. But again, all those technologies generally assume that there's a human user doing stuff, right? Posting uh, videos, uh, text posts, forms was a big thing at that time. Not sure if they still exist, but um, yeah, so that was one of the main shortcomings. Those are the two main shortcomings I just want to highlight here. Um, Server-side modification, of course, and the um, messiness of HTML or the inner, well, you could force it and say, hey, if you write your HTML exactly that way, I can make it machine consumable. But guess what? That would never be happening in practice, right? So um, that was the key thing. <clears throat> so rest to the rescue, because that's what it basically does. It fixes some of those issues. Um, it, it kind of takes the perspective um, of the web and uses the same technology, but uh, deals with the M2M -M communication problem, right? That is machine to machine communication problem and server side state modification. That's one of the other same features. So, and you just mentioned that's the REST guy, and now this is the REST guy. The other one was the web guy, the dub 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 uh, uh, guy, but this one is the REST guy, Roy Fieldy. And the only, um, <clears throat> so we're talking Tim Berners Lee in 1991, providing the baseline. HTTP protocol and HTML is a basic representation. And this guy in around 2000, well, in exactly 2000, um, um, came up with this um, you know, representation state transfer protocol that builds uh, on HTTP. Or actually, if you want to put it carefully, it fixes uh, HTTP in many respects. And it's now pretty much the standard. <clears throat> because now it supports both, of course, the human readability uh, aspect, flexibility in terms of you know, content payload and so on, but also uh, mechanisms of actually provoking changes on the server. That's the main main contribution. That's something you're going to be using. Not as of now, you'll find that assignment one only works with GET requests, right? You don't need to do anything on any of those servers. You just get information, you know, uh, mix this, integrate it, and send it to user. But you're not just the uh, forced to deal with this. So we're kind of shooting ahead a bit, but I think it's important to get this uh, 
standard price. <clears throat> ah, cool, that actually works. So what are the principles of RESTful system? Every time you look this up, you get up to those six points. That's why I briefly want to go over those to get a feel, right? So some of the principles of HTTP I should retain, that would be, for example, the um, client server model. So the idea is basically not the fact that it's interaction between client server, but that is a separation of concerns. The client side has certain responsibilities in the interaction, for example, holding state, and the server side has certain responsibilities. So um, statelessness, that's the next point. So uh, REST was not built in mind with having continuous sessions of interaction, multiple interactions, but really get a resource, change a resource, create a resource, delete a resource, right? Those, those kind of uh, principles, but not really to have entrenched sessions, meaning logging into your banking account and then doing you know, multiple interactions. That, that's not REST anymore. There's something else sitting on top of it um, that builds on it. But the idea is there that the client is always represent, uh, um, responsible for retaining state of an interaction. The server is responsible for maintaining the data, right? So basically providing the resource. And the, the nice part about this model is that it uh, becomes inherently scalable because if the server would need to do all those burdens, retaining, for example, the state of an interaction with the client, right? If you open your bank account, then the server would need to keep saying, okay, what is he looking at right now? And guess what? If that server would do that for 500,000 users, quite a bit of load, right? It doesn't scale well. So the idea is super simple on the server. No, 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 no. The client needs to figure out where it is right now and get the necessary resources by you know, tying them up sensibly. The server just provides the data or affords the change. Also means if the server goes down and comes up again, no problem, right? Because the client side thinks where it actually was the last day. So, so the, the, the idea was be to offload a lot of responsibility from the, from the server there um, as well. So it's kind of um, improves portability, reliability, and kind of robustness in a, in a way. The, um, <clears throat> so again, the state is the point that the state is held in the client. So when the state is not in the community, not in the connection. Like if you think, for example, uh, about uh, did you learn about TCP and IP and all that? Yes, please a bit. Right, we we'll go over that again in another session. But if you, for example, know that TCP is a uh, um, 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 it's not stateless, right? You establish a session and have you know continuous interaction over it, over connection until you close it. You know, so there's a lot of uh, weight, a lot of, um, 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 yeah, well, a lot of weight, basically, on your server because you need to maintain this uh, connection as long as it's established. In REST, which, of course, it's a few layers higher, so it's just a rough comparison, that's not really the problem because you just disconnect after each interaction, reconnect after the next one, and still have a fluid client kind of, kind of experience. Cacheability responses, certain responses can be cached on the client, so you don't need to request them again by hitting F5 like crazy like your browser does as well, right? So even you press F5, your browser first looks at the cache and sees if there's um, uh, anything, any information you can possibly uh, retrieve and REST can do the same. So the idea is there, if you look at the same page that you did like two seconds ago or something, it just uses possibly information that is cached and allows for caching in certain instances. Uh, layered system means that the system can be complex. So meaning the fact that you are inquiring something from here, from the client, I'm just pointing at the figure right now at the far left where the client side sits of our assignment example. When we request something from the client from a server, it doesn't need to be the final server, right? It, it can obscure the fact that the data is actually coming from here. That's meant by this layered system idea. Because that could be arbitrary further there. Those two guys could rely on a, you know, two other servers or five other servers. Perhaps you're invoking hundred service, services and you wouldn't even know because you're just interacting with this one. So that's the idea. You can offload things um, as well. Code on demand, yeah, well, the idea was basically also there, uh, the, the server can, you know, oh, one of the, that's more like an aspiration, I think nowadays, again, talking security is not a clever idea. In some instances, the server could deliver executable code and just run it on a client. Like, Here's the code, just run it for me, no worries, <laughs> really fine. So I think that's not necessarily, from a security point of view, desirable property to have. Uh, but so I, that's why I put it in parentheses. I don't think it has really been exploited. And of course, a uniform interface. And that's where you guys come into, into play, because if you know that interface, and you know half of it already, at least the get side, then you can kind of interact with any of those services, right? So that's the cool part, and build them. And that's where uh, it comes back to cloud uh, in terms of its relevance. Any questions? I'm talking like a... Uh, uh, service is a quite broad concept. Yes, it's, it's a bright, quite broad concept, and it's really focused on the infrastructure. So it sits on the application level in terms of the, the protocol, still HTTP, 
but it focuses on um, the, 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 the fundamental functionality that you need to have for data modification. What are the four? Yeah, that's four. I was going to try with my son figure out if it's four again because he says it's five or whatever. So anyway, um, so what are the fundamental activities that you can do on data? You learned that elsewhere. And if not, in databases. Crush. What does Crush stand for? Uh, Edit. Yeah, yeah, but what's the actual term they use for edit is right? Uh, update. update, yep. Uh, yeah. Destroy. Delete. Yeah, there you go. So uh, <laughs> well, it's close enough. So okay. you, you, you get 50% of the mark. Now, Rune is nice. You probably get 70% of the mark in, in databases, but semantically, you got it all right. So uh, that's right, the CRUD principles, right? And sometimes people also say oh, there's a CRUD principle S standing for search because it becomes a more and more important feature with large you know, database and so the ability to search as well. But that's not one of the original ones. But the idea is basically, if you have a data item, or let's say, let's call it a resource, a very important point in REST, if you have a resource, you can do all those basic manipulations that, that you just mentioned, right? So create the resource or an instance of it, read it, look at it, get requests, we had that already, change it, update, and of course, delete it. And by doing this, you can, from a client side, manage server-side resources comprehensively. And that's what REST brought us up uh, about. And that's back to your earlier point that we say, hey, we can't do anything on the server. You can do only stuff on the client and you know, press F5 to get the information again and again. But we also do want to do changes on the server. And this is basically what REST gives us, um, you know, a protocol for doing change all across the system, but not by having a you know, a browser interface with nice buttons, but actually doing it from a machine-based uh, perspective, right? Quite straight forward so that's the um, rest principles does it respond to the um, comment on extent if there's a follow-up just let me know just you can interrupt me at any time um yeah so okay um, i just want to go briefly over this, the central interface idea right so there is there's uh, a few principles that we need to bear in mind and they are relevant for you because you become designers uh, of course of apis application programming interfaces right so and they follow the REST principle. Therefore, you need to follow certain uh, conventions. Let me get that into it. So, number one, if you have a resource, um, is um, the, the resource um, that you use or modify is generally identified as part of the URL, right? So, if we think about um, a, um, the, I may spin it up later. See if we find time. If you think about, for example, the um, I think Marge talked about the student system, right? Didn't he? Service? Yes, no. Oh, let's backtrack. Let's go to the currency converter. There's a, a currency history, right? So currency converter a history. You can look at the history of all the things, right? So, and the idea is there that there's some meaning encoded in the UL already. By saying history, you kind of know what you're probably going to get already, right? So the meaning is encoded as part of the UL. The resource you modify, well, no. The resource you're interacting with because you're not modifying the history of the exchange api and if you manage to do so don't tell anyone um but you're accessing it right so you can do a subset of the functionality not in all instances does rest mean you can do everything on the server there's still you know authorization concerns please but in principle you could um but when you get for example the history then you know already okay i'm actually concerned about the history information whatever that may be in the payload the idea is there's a bit of a self-descriptiveness embedded in the URL. You just don't call it uh, X, uh, uh, Y, Z, uh, ABC or whatever, and then assume that's the history behind it, because that would just be a very bad approach to security by obscurity, I guess, which we shouldn't do anyway. So uh, no, but REST kind of wants to identify the resources. If you have a you know, a server that maintains student data, guess what? The path probably should be called students, right? Or students, depending uh, on what you possibly get. So this is quite fun here. Um, the modification is based on representation. What does that mean? Well, um, so instead of sending um, instead of sending some sort of complex instructions of how you should modify something on a server, you basically do it super simplistically. You get something from a server. Let's say student with student information, you know, name, user, uh, user ID, student ID, and age, whatever. I think that's the example that you heard about in, 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 in the Golang introduction already. And instead of telling the server, yeah, you know, I, I want to modify the name by injecting, uh, you know, a new character before the last character of the name or whatever, you just modify this thing, send it back to the server, say, that's what I want, right? So the representation in the payload is what you want the resource to look like. So instead of having a protocol that defines modifications, you just take what you get, change it, send it back, 
and then expect the server to kind of take this uh, as the response. So resource based on representation. And it's self-descriptive, we talked about this a bit already, content type pepper, and are super important, we'll get back to this. And um, the fact, um, th th this protocol, hey, I, 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 I don't know who came up with this acronym already. I mean, if you read this nowadays, you think like you're in the wrong forum. But, um, but basically the idea is that uh, you should think about linkages between resources, right? So if you have a, um, oh no, Go back to databases, right? In database, you think about, you talk about, uh, you, you're having database right now, right? Right. So you talk about normalization already, right? Normalizing data and backwards now uh, forms, like first normal form, second, third normal form, right? Where you decompose into different tables. And this idea, there was something in the chat. Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that was instructive. <laughs> I just see the blinky blinky, but I don't see the chat because of my screen. So thanks. Um, what you do there, what, what are you doing there in the, uh, when you actually uh, produce the third normal form, for example? What are you doing there? What's happening? What are you trying to avoid by doing the whole normalization process? You start the normalization history. Oh, okay, that's unfair. Okay, okay, okay. So you are basically bringing first everything back to your old to the atomic form, right? So all the tuples are in their full complexity, right? And then you are identifying in, when you, in, you perform the normalization, you are identifying substructures in there, right? So a student, guess what? Hey, student has a name. Yeah, it's functionally dependent. I mean, it, it, you know, the name is kind of attached to the student, right? So maybe uh, two two students be named Tom Morton, but nevertheless, they are two distinct Tom Morton. Uh, but they are work. Oh, hang on. They're studying the same university, though, right? But university is kind of an independent activity, an entity in the wider sense, right? So then you sort this out, move this in a different uh, table or relation, as it's called in relational databases. And instead of keeping all this information with the students and saying, "Oh, you tend to people aren't the new students," you just have a unique identifier pointer pointing to that other table, right? That identifies more about NTNU because NTNU itself may have dependent properties, multiple like campuses. Uh, subject, you know, that are supporting website, you name it, whatever. So this decomposition process, right, of breaking data up based on the primary entities, um, this is the same basically here. So the idea is, if you have a lot of payload information, such as, let's say, a student system that uh, makes reference to um, student, you assume you have a field that says uh, university and uh, location of university, then you would say, hey, hang on, the university and the location university is an independent entity that should be managed elsewhere. Because if it changed the location of the university, say, NTNU moves to Hama, that's the best thing that we do, no worries there, uh, then uh, it would be just one change, right, of information that would affect, apply to all students, right? You need, wouldn't need to go through each student and figure out, okay, is the university still in the right place, right? So, and that's the same here. So if you have a resource that relies on another resource, then you should work with linkages between those resources as opposed to having everything in one resource. You know, that's the idea. So you would have two endpoints in my example. You would have a student endpoint and let's say a university endpoint, right? They are distinctive in different resources where the student one, uh, you can't read this, but you need to just assume that my narrative follows what I'm doing here. So you have students here and you have the university information here, but from a student, you could say, hey, if you want a unique identifier or information about your university, here's the link, right? Which basically points to the university um, path, right? So that's this principle of those, this acronym I will not pronounce. Um, so, you know, the linkages between resources as one principles. Yeah. So those are a few principles that are important for REST. And I just want to be, uh, keep you in mind because you now, if you switched your perspective to designer mode and you need to see yourself in a situation of actually designing an API, that's something you need to think about the principles. Right, so unique unique identification of resources, ideally by name, self descriptive, uh, linkages of dependencies, anyway, and you want to have self descriptiveness. For example, you want to tell the user when you deliver information what content, uh, what, what 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 structure the payload is of. Right, you want to tell them, hey, you're actually receiving JSON right now. That's a very cheap one, very easy one. So no worries. I'm just telling you the content type is something um, that's um, quite quite useful for that. Purpose. It's 11. You need 15 minutes break because I have been talking for probably 45 minutes. Um, sorry for that. Apologies. But um, we we'll probably reconvene in 15 past. Are there questions in the meantime or even after that? If I leave things unclear, just, you know, ask me. You can also ask me next question in case you need uh, a week to digest. 
uh, which is perfectly fine. Right. So it's just um, very abstract, but it will come back once you start designing. Anyway, 15 minutes break. So thanks for still being here or coming back, whatever combination you prefer. Uh, questions in the meantime? Other than why does the coffee machine produce coffee? I don't know, that could be a concern, of course, I can relate to. Um, but let's assume that wasn't one, so that's good. Um, rest. Good. So we briefly talked, or well, you mostly listened, unfortunately, but uh, nevertheless, uh, briefly learned, hopefully, about REST, the principles, and uh, you know, exam question, what's that re what does REST stand for? Because I need to ask stuff. So representational state transfer. That's what it stands for, right? So, but you get the gist, right? So um, the exam thing is something I indeed ask, but that's not the point. The point is here that whatever you transfer, the payload you transfer is how the resource should look like, right? There's no abstraction between the representation on the server and the payload that you uh, transmit, right? So it's uh, different. So for example, if you think about uh, an example where it's not the case is SQL, right? So the representation on the server, what you get in response is the tabular relation format. How you send requests, however, is SQL strings, right? They're not the rep same representation. You just tell them, create the entity of the following entity, but the syntax and structure is different from what you get if you would do a select on a student, for example, right? which is a tabular format. Right? So there's an example where the representation are not the same. They are similar, they're convertible, but they're not the same. Here's like the same thing. Whatever you get with a get request is something you would put with a post request, as we'll learn in a few minutes. That you would use to create something. Please. I, I, I don't really understand that. Can you, can you explain that one? Yeah. So, so um, the, 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 the point when I want to get it is representational state transfer. That is, the key thing is about having a uniform representation, right, in, on client side, doing, close, doing, doing, doing transmission on, on the server side, right? So, if you have a student structure, um, I, I just throw that up briefly. So, let's assume that is. Um, I'm drawing JSON here uh, with an entity that has a name, an ID, and for the sake of beauty. So here's something you shouldn't do. You shouldn't draw on stuff, top of stuff you drew uh, before, right? So that's a layering problem. But anyway, let's get away with this. So um, we have, uh, what I'm drawing here is basically just a JSON um, uh, object with the or uh, structure, basically with a name entity, right? So that's just a student, a string, whatever else. This is an ID, which is, let's say, an integer, um, one, two, three, four, or we use my actual student number. Anyway, um, so H is uh, 42, because that's the only number we should use in computer science. So, um, so let's, let's assume we have this structure. And the idea is that this representation, JSON in this instance, right? It's used on the client side. You send this information with this structure. It's used during transmission. You recall HTTP, uh, the payload thing. Uh, let's see, three, four, is it hanging? Oh, that doesn't. This one, this would be a, this is now HTML, it's clear, right? But you would send exactly that payload in here, right? And on the server, it's also represented in the same format, right? That's the idea, a uniform representation across uh, uh, the entire process. And in SQL, that's my, the point I was making is, that's not the same, right? In SQL, you have a tabular representation on the server side. Everything is a relation, that is a table, right? That's the proper term to be used with different columns. But when you modify this, you use some different language. Yeah? You just don't, hey, give me the whole table. I do my changes, here's the whole table deck. This is now the server side state. What you do is, no, 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 no. You, you say alter table, you say, uh, you know, updates. Uh, you know, you say, you send the CRUD primitives effectively, followed by a distinct syntax that's related to the primitives, right? Update syntax is slightly different from create, right? Because you need to say, uh, you know, you, yeah, you, need, you, you know, I mean, that's databases, you, you get the understanding. It's all about that you send commands to say what you do on the server, but it doesn't contain the actual payload of how it should look like in the response. And rest you do. The server is not able to do, uh, you know, particular um, or they are the hex to it, but uh, the, 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 the server will not, if you have 500 students, you can't tell it, change the age or increase the age by one on all students. That's never going to happen. The only thing you do is take all the students, modify the age by increasing by one for whatever reason, and post the whole thing back and say, save this, please, right? So in REST, the server is kind of stupid, 
put it this way, right? Which is good because uh, it, it, it removes a lot of burden uh, from a computational point of view and makes it very flexible, but it also makes it very easy to program against it because you know the semantics already. What, what, can, do, what can a server do? What can't it do is very straightforward in REST, right? So um, that's why representational um, state. So whatever you transfer is the state that you are, you know, desire to have on a server or have on a server. If you get request, that's the state of a server. If you send a post request, that's the state you want the server to be. Whether the server says, yes, I'm saving this or not, different problem, but fundamentally that's the idea. Does it help? So that's, um, 